Who are you? That's what I was saying to myself when I stood in front of this group for the first time two years ago. I had no idea what this community was, who you were. I didn't know if I belonged. I knew tech writing was in the description and somebody nudged me and said, you should go. And next thing I know, I'm on this stage looking out. We're all at the Mission Theater. How many were there for the first year? So we have a, a bunch of returnees. How many are here for the second time this year that just came last year? And then how many first timers? Whoa! That's awesome. You guys have found your tribe. I can tell you that now, but I didn't know then. But I knew that there was something in the air and if you remember that Twitter stream from the first year, oh man, I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, it was this brainy love going on over all of our heads. And I had to come back last year, and, uh, and here I am, of course. So now I think I know who you are, because I pretty much know who we all are. We're all Abbott and Costello, when you get right down to it. Nineteen eighty-three. Yeah, I've been doing this for a while. So Ronald Reagan has been in the White House for two years. There's a new upstart band called The Police. They have uh, the number one song that year. You might remember, it goes, every breath you take every move you make. Karen, you're about to stand up and dance. I know you are. <laughs> so some of you are back there with me. Do we have any 32-year-olds in the room right now? So we have at least one, two, three, four, five. So you guys are all going, yeah, 1983, I was in the hospital getting born. <laughs> Well, I was just getting out of grad school. And these were the days, I didn't even know there was such a thing as tech writing. These were the days word processor was a console. There was no desktop publishing. There was no even dot matrix printer, no Microsoft Word, no email. I mean, I lived through those days and I can't even imagine it anymore. Well, into my life comes Karen Shemansky. Now, you may remember, you will remember, the person in your life who gave you your first break, got you your first job, maybe an internship, and what a difference it made to you. So you have some idea what Karen means to me. She had left academia. She had her PhD in English and uh, somehow managed to convince people at Magnavox CATV in Syracuse, New York to hire her as a technical writer. And she's one of these people that believes in making the pie bigger. So she set up an internship and I was one of the people that got the chance to start a career in technical writing thanks to Karen. Now let's just get situated. I'm going to talk to you about this company, Magnavox CATV, that I was writing for. It was the new days of cable TV, and my company was the one creating all those things hanging out on the poles that pushed the signals along. So this is what people were watching back then. And you remember these shows? What are we looking at here? I got a Dallas. Jefferson's Love Boat, all right, yep. So this is what I was watching TV on back then. Black and white, yes. I was a poor student. 
But do you remember, those of you who are older than our 32 year olds here, do you remember getting up and walking across the room and changing the channel, right? <laughs> So I'm working for Magnavox CATV, creating one of the first remote controls in the world. And this is the document <laughs> that my first assignment was to redo this document for the new version of this machine here. This sits on the top of the TV, this converter box, and my job was to explain to people how to use this thing. So I was all excited. This is the old manual, and this is what it looked like inside. And I thought, oh man, I cannot wait. I can do so much better than that. I mean, it's just a bunch of blocks of text. And step five there isn't even a step. So I couldn't wait to dig in. And I'll tell you, this meant a lot to me. I still carry this around with me. <laughs> this is what we came up with. And I just was so proud of this piece. This was my portfolio piece. And I mean, it's got color, it has step tabs, it's got pictures, it walks you through. How can you go wrong? Well, Karen Shemansky, lucky for me, knew human nature, and she grabbed a friend of hers down the hall. She says, Mary, take your lunch hour. I want you to come down, and I want you to come and sit in this chair. And I want you to try this manual out. And she had instructed me to sit behind Mary and observe. Now, there's no such thing as UX back then. No usability labs. But Karen knew it didn't matter. You just needed to get a person. And you needed to sit and watch with your mouth closed. So I sat there behind Mary. And I just couldn't wait for Mary to open it up and exclaim how wonderful it was. So. <laughs> Mary's sitting there, and we had the TV. Of course, we need our remote. Pretty cool for 1983. So she's sitting there. And let's see. Uh, Heidi, you don't mind being the TV, do you? OK. You're so she's looking at the instructions, and she's see if I have it in front of you. She's looking at the picture of what's on this little screen and she's looking at the TV which is off and trying to turn it on and pushing the button and looking back and looking. We had to tell her you have to aim the remote at the TV. I had made a huge assumption and didn't have a clue that I had made the assumption. Today, who would think anybody needs to be told? There's a little beam that has to go invisibly. That was a lesson I've never forgotten about communicating to understanding. You can't know that you've done it until you see somebody on the other end going, oh, I get it, or oh, I don't get it. And you won't know what you need to fix till you see that person's eyes glazing over going, I have no idea what I'm doing wrong here. So what we did was change our cover. And that one change immediately got people to understand what they had to do. But we would have never known we needed to communicate this if we hadn't done our little test with Mary. So that lesson has been with me ever. Whoa. Uh, 
You guys don't mind if I get that, do you? <laughs> Hello? I'm kind of busy right now. It's uh, my bakery, just a second. No, it's um, orange and yellow flowers. And I wanted to say best wishes, Suzanne. Just underneath that, we will miss you. We will miss you, yes. Thanks, and um, no need to call back. Sorry. <laughs> How could that baker not have understood me? It's a miracle of modern technology, pretty cool. Things like this happen to all of us. I mean, I've been that baker. And I'm not trying to convince anyone that somebody was really stupid here. Um, it's so easy to miscommunicate. We have misunderstandings every single day. And so, when I say we are all Abbott and Costello, I trust that you can in some way relate. Now, has anybody here not ever heard Abbott and Costello doing their famous routine? Okay, so this won't be a first. Well, now, let's see. We have on the bags. We have who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out. What silly name. I say who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third. Are you the manager? Yes. You know the fellow's name? Well, I should. Well, then who's on first? Yes. I mean the fellow's name. That's it. That's who? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first base. Who? Have you got a first base? Who is on first? I'm asking you who's on first. <laughs> That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Now, tell me who's on first. That's right. I want to know what's the guy's name on first. No, base. no. What's on second base? I'm not asking you who's on first. Who is on first? I don't know. He's on third. Now, we're not asking third. Now, let's Anybody ever done anything like that? <laughs> so I have a few stories to share with you. We have a tenant lives in our basement, great guy. We explained to him when he first moved in, when you leave, you're, you're gone for months at a time, traveling all around the world, please park in our driveway so that if anyone needs to get in, uh, there won't be any problem and park on the road the rest of the time. And he nodded his head, everything's clear, everything's great. And then the first time he went to France for a couple of months, he got it wrong. And of course, we had a big truck that needed to get in our driveway and we had to go fish around, find his key, try to get in his car, set off the wet, wet, wet in our quiet neighborhood and we're all running around trying to figure out how to turn it off. It's the simplest thing, but we just never thought to confirm with him, did you really understand? We just assumed that he knew. Sometimes the stakes are a little bit higher. I went to get my knee cut into last year. And as I'm wheeling down to uh, get knocked out, I said to the nurse, can you make sure that they know that he has to cut into the right knee? And luckily for me, the nurse knew that I was Abbott and the doctor was Costello and she made sure that that doctor was gonna know which knee not to cut into. It's just so easy to misunderstand. And I'm sure all of you have had a writing project where something was at stake and you had to do maybe just the extra mile, maybe an extra test with a friend down the hall. Say, hey, can you please look at this, make sure it's clear. We can't afford to not be clear here. You go that extra mile, do that extra thing. One tool that I like a lot for making sure that my text is as clear as it can be, it's 
It's really fun to use. It's called HemingwayApp.com. You plug in into the blank space you'll see if you go to that web page. Just plop in any text, copy and paste it in, and it will give you an evaluation and tips. So if you're doing your Abbott and Costello routine in one of your instructions, you'd be at a very good readability and you'd have great scores down here. And if you plop in something a little more complicated, it will highlight for you the things you might want to fix. So in this case, for example, green is passive voice and it'll just plop, pull, pull those things right out for you and give you a quick analysis of things you might want to fix. So I find it really handy, kind of fun. This is what you don't want it to look like. <laughs> Actually came from this, I copied and pasted this from source material from a client. Did not show it to them, but I'm sure you've all seen similar things from your source material. And I happened across a similar tool on GitHub, just a few of you may be familiar with GitHub, which I learned about from this group two years ago. I'm going to show you a project put together by Brian Ford of Google, and he calls it Write Good. Anybody use this? I have no idea how to use GitHub projects. I'm no way an expert, but it just looks really cool. It looks to me like the GitHub version of Hemingway app. And what he's done is uh, create a, what he calls a naive linter for English prose for developers who can't write good and want to learn to do other stuff good too. <laughs> and by the way, he says, important, do not use this tool to be a jerk to other people about their writing. <laughs> Go, Brian. So maybe you all know what a linter is. This is new to me. A linter is a tool to clean up code. And I'm assuming that naive linter means maybe that it's unsophisticated. It's pretty basic. It's going to highlight some of the same types of things we were just looking at. So passive voice, uh, something he calls illusion, which is a, a, a word that's duplicated. Uh, so there is weasel words, adverbs. Ooh, adverbs. We have some adverb conversations going on at this conference. Uh, cliches. So it's going to find these things. It's going to highlight them for you in your GitHub code. Cool. Now, some of you who have heard me talk before won't be surprised that I zeroed in on the passive voice and that there is because Guess what those involve? I have a thing about B verbs, and uh, I even do have bumper stickers. Anybody who would like one, it says, start seeing B verbs. I brought them with me, so come and get them. Now, this is his answer to me when I asked him, what's a naive linter? It figures, Ed, you would know what that means. Probably everybody in this room who's used GitHub, but I'm looking at that and I'm going, you know what, I really wanted to tweet him back. <laughs> Communicating to understanding is not as easy as it seems. I mean, it looks like it should be really simple. It's one person saying something to another person and the other person saying something back. What's so hard about that? It's just pretty simple. We can all just tell what people are thinking and that Vulcan mind meld, I don't know, it works for me. Um, not. This is what really happens. This is what communication is really like. 
It's more like Chinese telephone than the Vulcan mind meld. 70 to 90 percent of what we hear gets changed. So to communicate the understanding, we need to do something more like this, what your eye doctor does. Can you see it now? Is that clear? And it needs a couple of rounds and you wait for that person to say, yeah, I got it. There are so many things that get in the way of good communication when I was writing my manual for that Magnavox converter box, I made a huge assumption. When my baker was putting my cake together, chances are he, she, had something else on his mind, was preoccupied. When I was in, uh, in grad school, we used to have a newsletter for um, the, the graduate assistants and one of my favorite features was called the Pullet Surprise. And we would pick something from a freshman essay that just struck our funny bones. So the Pullet Surprise this week was, it's a doggy dog world. <laughs> so maybe there was a little confusion going on there for that person. But there's a whole lot working against communication. And the examples I've given so far, nothing really was at stake, but sometimes there's a lot at stake. And I imagine you're familiar with the story of the Hubble Space Telescope. You may have seen some of the spectacular photos that it's sent back. It took 15 years to develop, cost $3 billion, by 1990 dollars and people had huge expectations and the first thing that came back was this this was not what they were hoping for and people were pissed heads were gonna roll finally they figured out what had happened The reflective null corrector had a flaw. So it was designed that this metering rod, the light would shine right onto the top of it through this little field cap here, and it was off. 1.3 millimeters, the size of a piece of rice. I mean, this is tiny. That wasn't really in the null corrector. <laughs> Charlie Pellerin decided he was going to get to the bottom of this. What is going on? And he found that there were things going on in the culture. The problem with Hubble wasn't merely a technical failure. It's the same thing that happened with the fatal explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger. He said that there was a social shortfall at NASA. People were being hammered. There was pressure to launch, launch, launch. And how many of us have not felt that pressure at work? We got to launch that product. We know what it's like to try to communicate under pressure. Well, these guys had huge stress. I'll just give you a minute to read that. Threatening, humiliating, angry, hostile. People would communicate at their peril. So this is not an atmosphere any of us can do our best work in. The people at NASA were dealing with all this kind of thing in the air all the time at work. PhDs sitting at their desks getting drunk. I mean, this was just a terrible environment. And Charlie ended up 
taking the fall and had the congresswoman in charge of NASA appropriations come at him with her eyes on fire and spitting in his face and poking him in the chest saying, you will never get a penny to fix your precious Hubble. I don't want to hear the word Hubble ever again. And Charlie decided that he was going to figure it out and he fixed the Hubble. He knew what the world would be deprived of. He didn't want the world to miss this. They forgave him for the money that he spent fixing it. They advanced him to the highest levels in NASA. And he went on to teach courses in communication skills and leadership. And in fact, NASA brought him back as a trainer and they re recognized that they had a problem. So when I hear stories like this, I think, well, fine, but I'm not empowered to do that kind of thing in my workplace. But what kind of problems do you have in your workplace that you might be able to have some influence over? What would Charlie do if he stepped into your job tomorrow? There are opportunities there with your name on them. If I were making a movie about Charlie Pellerin, I might call it The Miracle Worker. I'm, I had been assuming that everybody would have seen this movie until I told my husband about my talk and he said, what movie are you talking about? So I want to give you just a, a hint about what this movie is. Has anybody here not ever seen The Miracle Worker? Oh, good, okay, so this will be a first. Helen Keller is the subject of the movie. At 19 months old, she got, I think it was a scarlet fever. And this became her world for the rest of her life. So imagine, you can't hear, you can't see. And her life and her parents' life became hell. They gave her everything she wanted. And in the movie, you see her going around the table at dinner time and just feeling her way and grabbing pe people's food and stuffing it in her face. She had no idea how to behave. Her parents didn't know what to do with her, so they hired Annie Sullivan, the miracle worker. And this amazing scene, Annie is teaching Helen how to eat with a spoon. And they were going head to head for hours. Annie was determined that Helen was going to understand how to behave and understand how to communicate. So this is a scene after weeks of Annie Sullivan spelling, wanting Helen to understand that these motions are words, D, O, L, L, and Helen's grabbing her hand. And Helen's doing the same to the dog because Helen does not know this game has meaning. And finally, after weeks of this kind of, of, of wrangling, does, who remembers the scene where Helen figures out, where are they? Do you remember where they were? They're outside. At the pump. And the word was water. W-A-T-E-R, and this has happened over and over and over, and something finally clicked, and I don't know, can you even see out there? It doesn't look, you can't see it very well, the screen is so dark. This is Helen at the pump with Annie, and just something in her brain figured out this was a word. Her whole life changed, and I mean, in this scene, she's running around the yard grabbing things and you know the ground and spelling it into Annie's hand she finally understood what it was to communicate and she had language and these two women were fast friends for the rest of their lives so much has been given to me I have no time to ponder over that which has been denied 
Now that took a lot to break through to understanding. I would like to share with you a bit from the 1930s, the only surviving footage of these two women um, talking. The first word she learned to articulate was the little word it. With the hand in this position, I made the vowel I. She felt it. I. Then I made the T. She feels it with the finger on her lips, on my lips. Then I put the two letters together to form the word. It. And the first word was learned. After her seventh lesson, she was able to speak the sentence word by word. I am not dumb now. So what I know about all of you is that not only are you Abbott and Costello, but you are Annie and Helen, too. And technical writers, documentarians, we're miracle workers in our own way. I met some yesterday over at the writing day from a company called Agile Bits. They had come with their product iPassword and set up a table and said, we are looking for feedback. They were sitting there saying, Mary, come and test out this documentation and see if you can use this remote control. So I went and I sat and I watched and I listened. So we have Nick and Mitchell here over on the left with, uh, are you guys in the room here? There you are, yay. And I know you had some other people in your team who weren't in the picture, and you can't see you very well, but you're right over here. And uh, we had Antoine here hanging out. Just, it was a great day, lots of people, everybody helping each other out. So I'm watching Nick and Mitchell and the people that they're asking questions. And this is what they were showing people. Their app says at the top, master password. Protect your vault with a master password that only you know. Their product keeps track of all of your passwords for your life, everything, with one master password that all you have to do is remember that one master password. And imagine forgetting your master password and everything is gone. So they have a lot at stake here, and they are asking people, what would you, so what would you put in here for your master password? Maybe put in some uppercase, lowercase, you might put in some symbols, maybe a backwards, or, or a three to be a backwards E, we all have those tricks that we do, and they want people to know, no, you're gonna forget that stuff, don't do that. We want you to do some other things, it's gonna be really memorable, use all lowercase, Take four random words out of the dictionary and mix them up. Not out of your brain, by the way, then they won't be random. Uh, so they knew what they wanted people to do. Nobody does it. And they wanted to save people from losing all their passwords of their whole lifetimes. So they asked, what should we say on our instruction page that we're going to make that's going to make this all clear for everyone that you can link to from here? And what they heard yesterday Somebody said, I'm never going to that page. You gotta give it to me right here. See, all right, I'm seeing the heads are nodding. Everybody's like, yeah, duh. But it's not a duh until you hear somebody say it. It was a duh I should have known to tell Mary to point at the TV, but it just hadn't occurred to me. So they took advantage yesterday of this chance to get that feedback. I'm going to move a little quicker here than I would normally, so the story I'm going to tell, I'll just condense it way down. Uh, but another tech com 
a, a miracle worker that I haven't had the privilege of working with is Karen Ronning Hall, Kaya Communications here in town. Karen, right here in the middle. And uh, Karen's, Karen's one of my heroes. She has started a company, and you can't see the, all the wonderful glowing faces around the table. Can you? Can you see it at all? Well, there are wonderful glowing faces around the table. She has started a company here of technical communicators, editors, writers, designers, and we all um, have a process that's a very rigorous process that she has designed. And the most important thing that for, for my purposes today is the piece of getting that feedback. We go back to the client as often as we need to, get that feedback, we go to each other, we call each other up, hey, that doesn't make sense. So that when, oh, by the way, now you can see which one Karen is there with the, uh, <laughs> with the halo, Karen, can you see the halo? Um, when we're on the phone with our, our, our kickoff group of the SMEs, the, the uh, subject matter experts from all over the world, we have engineers from India, Ireland, we, we, have, we have lots of money sitting on that phone call. First thing Karen told me when we started working together was get yourself a call recorder. You're going to record these calls. Of course we tell people, but we don't want to miss anything that they're saying. We want to be able to go back and make sure we heard that right. And this is what we produce typically is a white paper on very technical subjects and her clients for years have been thrilled with her work. Through the recession, Karen never slowed down. She had to keep hiring people. So that's the kind of, to me, uh, everyday miracles that we all do. Even though we are Abbott and Costello, if we miscommunicate, it has an impact. We have people aiming their remotes at the ceiling. We have a $3 billion piece of junk floating around in space. We have a knee, the wrong knee maybe, getting cut into. We have customers losing a lifetime of their passwords. What we do to make sure we're communicating matters. Try to be serious. It's my baker again. Look, I know uh, you, you're really sorry, fine, but don't, just don't put any, I don't want, put nothing on this cake. Okay, thank you. <laughs> the fact is, we are all not Spock. Yes, now, on the St. Louis team, we have uh, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellas on the St. Louis I'm, team. I'm telling you, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. You know the fellas' names? Yes. Well, then who's playing first? Yes. I mean the fellas' name on first base. Who? The fella playing first base for St. Louis. Who? The guy on first base. Who is on first? Well, what are you asking me for? I'm not asking you, I'm telling you, who is on first? I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first base. Who is on first? Have you got a first baseman on first? Certainly. Right. Then who's playing first? Absolutely. When you pay off the first base for every month, who gets the money? Every dollar of it. Why not? The man's entitled to it. Who is? Yes. So who gets it? Why shouldn't he? Sometimes his wife comes down and collects it. Whose wife? Yes. <laughs> we are all Abbott and Costello. But nobody has to know. 